Thank you, Travis. Um, and thank you very much for the opportunity that I can share my love for wetlands, everything we've learned over the last several decades, and where we're taking wetlands in the future. So I don't think I need to explain the problem to everyone in this room. We're all very well aware of what are the contributors to nutrient loading in our waterways. Um, Obviously, they come from various sources. And so the key takeaway here is we do. We have multiple sources that are contributing to nutrients in our waterways, contributing to the water quality problem. So when we think about all these various sources, we really need a holistic solution to manage these sources and improve water quality. And that's where nature-based solutions come into play. And this is great because this has been the theme for today on nature-based solutions. We've been learning incrementally about these throughout the day. So um, I should have done some uh, trivia and done some quizzing here because we've all been learning about this all day. So basically, they're, you know, nature-based solutions are sometimes referred to engineering with nature. They're, yeah, we do utilize nature, but we are engineering these. They're um, a design approach that we leverage the positive benefits that nature offers but in conjunction with traditional engineering. But there's all these different layers of benefits and co-values that we gain from using nature-based solutions. And looking at, here we have a number of them here, um, some increasing biodiversity, improving our air and water quality, sequestering carbon, but also providing community assets. So benefiting the human well-being, and then furthering also our ESG goals and uh, corporate goals. So, Looking at different uh, nature-based solutions are tools or technologies that um, can offer ways to improve water quality. And it, it covers a wide variety of, of services from look, looking at green infrastructure we learned about earlier today. Uh, so blue, blue infrastructure, engineered wetlands, natural media filtration, but also going up into the watershed, into the catchment, looking at floodplain engagement. We learned earlier about the, you know, engaging, stepping our, our stream channels, opening up our stream channels to allow sediment to settle out. With that sediment also is nutrients, nutrients contributing to our degradation of water quality. So engaging the floodplain can help improve water quality. And what I'm talking about today, specifically of this, of this toolkit, is engineered wetlands. And these are, these are engineered treatment systems designed to mimic but also optimize the processes that occur in natural wetlands. So what are these processes? Well, they're very similar to conventional wastewater. It's the physical, the chemical, and the biological processes. So physical sedimentation, filtration, uh, chemical oxidation, reduction, volatilization, adsorption, chemical precipitation reactions, but also the biological. So there's plant uptake, there's actual biodegradation, and also off-gassing. So very similar, but just in a natural setting. So engineered wetlands. So wetlands have been treating wastewater for centuries. They've been the receiving ground for outfall discharges. Uh, going back to the turn of the last century where we had community wastewater was going into wetlands to provide water quality improvement, to manage that wastewater. And it's observations of water quality improvement that led to further investigation of what's actually happening. How are these systems managing improving water quality? Water quality? And that's in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. That's where we started investigating. Is it the plants? Is it the microbes? Is it the root system? Is it the, the media? And started investigating all these layers. And then it, got, it was really starting to get more mainstream recognition. Univers uh, we had major wastewater treatment plants using wetlands for polishing for tertiary treatment. Um, and then it started, we started looking at in the 80s and 90s, how can we improve these? How can we engineer these more, can we intensify these? Can we improve the performance? Can we look at you know, subsurface flow? In the 90s, we started adding aeration into the subsurface flow environment to improve performance, to improve degradation, um, um, year-round performance. We could operate in cold climates. But then it's, you know, we started looking at all these different applications. We started looking at different waste streams, landfill leachate, uh, looking at glycol, airport de-icing, glycol, high BOD, food and beverage, um, mine drainage petroleum compounds, really going after all these different applications. 
And then, of course, we get into the emerging contaminants, pharmaceuticals, PFAS. So all these studies looking at can, can these natural systems help remove those contaminants? And then where we are today. And this is kind of the later half of the presentation. I'm going to be talking about where we are and where we're going into the future. So talking about all these different applications. Easy, stormwater right away, right? We've learned, we were learning about that earlier today. CSO reduction, um, blue-green corridors. This is, that's a project in New Orleans where we're looking at trying to reduce flooding. Uh, industrial stormwater, so we're looking at more contaminated, not just solids, not just nutrients, but looking at contamination like uh, petroleum compounds, looking at metals. So we have a project in Iceland that's treating runoff from a smelter. We have a project in Arkansas that's treating metal runoff from an industrial manufacturing facility. Airport de-icing, high glycol. All the way to sanitary wastewater, we're doing that across the UK, United States, Canada, as well as groundwater remediation, chlorinated compounds, PCBs, petroleum compounds, uh, industrial process wastewater. So you can go from Iceland to Saudi Arabia, can, various climates that can be engineered for. And then of course with mine, mine water and metal removal. So there are two different, two basic types of wetlands. We have the free water surface wetland, which looks like a very, very much like a natural wetland. You have open water zones, you have shallow marshes, but it looks and feels just like a regular wetland, right? And then you have the subsurface flow. This is where you don't see any water. All the water is below the surface. It flows through either vertically or horizontally through a permeable media like gravel or sand, and you just see the vegetation. But that's really beneficial for waste, high toxic waste streams where you have potential ecological exposure. And all these can be broken out into all these different subsets, all these unique types of wetlands. So the free water surface. This is very, like, like I was saying, very much like a natural wetlands. So you have open water zones, your four bays. This is where you use pretty much as a standard BMP practice for stormwater. Shallow marshes, varying shallow marshes, low and high marshes, and a polishing micro pool various different types of treatment reactions. You have sedimentation, filtration, adsorption, um, and then degradation. This is actually a unique project because it was a collaborative effort between uh, Kleinfelder, Hatch, and Stantec. So this is outside Boston in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where as part of the Boston Harbor Cleanup Program, they were um, required to separate out their combined sewers, so reduce CSO discharges, and this project was a result of that. So where water is being diverted into this surface flow, that's just over three acre surface flow wetland, that is providing sedimentation, pretreatment before, and improving water quality before it went into the river. So it includes a number, like a four bay. Four bay is where all the sedimentation occurs, shallow marshes where you're having your filtration, your degradation of those dissolved constituents, and a polishing micro pool before it goes back out. Subsurface flow. As I was saying, you don't see standing water. Everything flows through the permeable media. So that's gravel, any like a high porosity or so, 35% or so is what we're looking for. And that's really where it's your attached growth a uh, biofilter. So you have your roots extending down into the gravel. That's where all the treatment occurs in and around the root systems. What's unique about these is that the wetland plants provide a source of oxygen for that degradation, the biodegradation. They release a very fine layer of oxygen around the root zones. That works in concert with the microorganisms, feet, helps support those microorganisms. That's why you have a very good high dense population of microorganisms to promote the degradation. This is a project we have in Casper, Wyoming. It is a combination of various types of wetlands, but what happened here was it's the old Amico refinery, and from years, it operated most of the last century, and over that operation, there was various hydrocarbons that were released into the subsurface environment where we had, they've recovered about 10 million gallons of El Napple to date, but there's still another 20 million that are left in the ground. So this project was designed to, in, to help manage that um, subsurface contamination. And it, it's a combination of um, extraction of that impacted groundwater, then running it through an oil water separator. We don't really want to send El Napple, 
El Napo directly into a wetland, and through, through a cascade aeration to help oxidize that groundwater, because it's extremely reduced. It's an El Napo plume, so all the microbes have consumed most of that oxygen. So we want to aerate that water and then send that through a, the first through a free water surface wetland, which helps eliminate all the iron oxide that we just oxidized, but then really send, then send it to the subsurface flow wetland, which is where you get your, most of your BTEX, your petroleum treatment. And as you can see from the data, we have excellent performance to non-detect year-round. So now we're getting more intensified, right? We start with a very natural system, then we're promoting subsurface where we're getting more intensified. Now it's about how can we, how can we engineer these so that we get even better performance? And that's where the subsurface flow intensified systems come in. So this is where we inject air either through fine bubble tubing or fine bubble um, diffusers, 12 inch diffusers, which you use in standard wastewater practice. And this helps um, to provide the microbes the air that it needs to degrade the ammonia, BOD, BTEX, other um, aerobic degradation compounds. Um, so this can operate horizontally or vertically. One great benefit of this, now we're not relying on the vegetation to provide all that air, right? We can go deeper. So by going deeper, instead of having a two foot deep system, we can actually go three or four feet deep. That reduces our footprint. So now it it's a smaller area. So now we can fit it into sites there where we couldn't necessarily fit a wetland in previously. This is an example of an air intensified system at the Buffalo Airport um, up in central New York. And this is to treat de-icing fluid. So de-icing fluid is um, primarily uh, propylene glycol. And that just is essentially cal you know, calculated to a BOD concentrations of biochemical oxygen demand. And if you release that into the environment, you're going to cause a significant uh, a loss of dissolved oxygen in your waterway, which will result in fish kills, et cetera. So this system is designed specifically to degrade that glycol. So and you can see that we've had concentrations upwards around 15,000 milligrams per liter of BOD and able to re degrade that through this aerated environment. And primarily the other thing is that since this is a winter operation system, it's most it's basically a enhanced biofilter because we're essentially getting all the microbial organisms. We're not reliant on plants here. You don't even have to plant the system. So in reality, is it really a wetland? I don't know. So that's kind of where we're at now. Like, so have we focused too much on intensification? Are we trying to compete with conventional wastewater where we really don't need to be? We should be, you know, take a step back. And what are the values? So when we think of a natural wetland, what are all the values that we assign the, the benefits, the functions and values of a wetland? So, you know, it's a source of food for fishing, habitat. It's a rest, a rest stop for migratory um, birds. Recreation, we enjoy. We, we like to kayak through these. We like to walk around these, bird watching. Um, but also flood storage. You know, we learned today about the benefits of all these nature-based solutions. In addition, the, obviously the water quality, but then we talk about water supply as well. So how can we engineer these wetlands now to have, can we, can we try and optimize those benefits as well? Can we add some diversity? For, for decades, we were focused on monoculture treatment wetlands and like cattails, bulrushes, phragmites, I know phragmites, but they, they do work really well. Um, but can we look at, can we optimize some of these benefits? So, you know, we know we got water quality down. We got that down, it's pretty easy. Flood storage, yeah, that's a, that's a given. We can have freeboard capacity to provide that flood storage. We know it's low operation and maintenance. Not no, you still have to maintain these systems. Um, low energy, low carbon, long lifespan. A lot of these systems have been operating for decades. Um, aesthetics, educational opportunities, habitat creation, and this leads to biodiversity. Like, we really should be thinking about designing these with more for all these, these lower, the aesthetics, the biodiversity, the education, um, the amenities. Let's look, really look at what the additional co-values these can offer. So this is where integrated constructed wetlands come into play. 
So this is a, um, a type of wetland, treatment wetland, that has been around for about 20 years in Europe. In Ireland, they came up with these for use in managing runoff from agricultural farm fields. And these essentially are taking wetlands to back to where they were centuries ago. Like wetlands sat where they sat in the landscape, down near the water. They, um, they helped filter runoff from the, from the upland areas in protecting our waterways. So it's take going back to what they were centuries ago. lag, sorry. Um, so in the UK, um, we're seeing significant increase in population for our small wastewater treatment facilities. We're seeing, we're also seeing lowering of discharge consents. So that's our nitrogen, our phosphorus, BOD. We're getting tighter and tighter on our consents. And our existing systems can't meet those consents. Um, so we're trying to it's really forcing the water utilities over there to come up with innovative approaches, new schemes of how they're going to be addressing this contamination um, instead of complete replacement of their wastewater facilities. In addition, the, the regulatory authority, the environmental agency, is also mandating that when you are looking at your options, you have to consider, you don't necessarily have to use, but you have to consider the use of nature-based solutions. So, Bing, that's a great opportunity. Let's look at how can we use nature-based solutions to help improve water quality. So the first um, integrated constructed wetland project we worked on about five years ago is for Yorkshire Water, and it's the Clifton system. It serves a population of less than 200 people, so a small system. It's, just, it's less than an acre in size, so 3,000 square meters. Um, we have 24,000 plants in that acre. Um, 25 different species with significant capex and opex cost savings. And importantly, you see that bottom number, a biodiversity net gain of 2.28. So what biodiversity net gain means is if you're going to do any kind of development in the, in the UK, you have to improve what you started with. So you can't just have a value of one. You can't just have no net loss. You actually have to improve where you are. So you have to make no more loss of habitat. You're increasing your habitat. So the existing system was just a primary sedimentation tank and an RBC. And then they took the water and they just discharged it to the land. Um, so for, for decades, you had wastewater just being applied to the land, which probably provided very, a decent water quality improvement just through treatment across that land surface. Um, but it was not going to meet the new limits for phosphorus. Now, we're not at 0 0.02. We don't have to, we don't have to go that low. But we, uh, we did have a limit of four. When you have wastewater coming in at 8 to 12 milligrams per liter, there's no way, and their, their system was not going to be able to achieve four. So we had a lot of flexibility on this. So under an operating techni techniques agreement, in which we negotiated, you have about three years to demonstrate the, this new technology and how it performs under the environment to then get a full-on permit after that. So we were able to get approval to build the system, operate it for three years, and collect the data to demonstrate to the environment agency that this is a viable technology. So it's a completely passive system. We are using um, the natural fall across the site. I'm going to... Go to the next slide. The natural fall across the site um, before it gets down to the river. So we situated four um, separate waste engineered wetland cells, two that are secondary treatment and two that are tertiary. And in, as the natural fall across the site, we used that drop and built in cascade aeration in between each, each system. Because one of the challenges we have with engineered wetlands is that they go pretty anoxic. They don't have a lot of oxygen. You get some oxygen diffusion, but that's about it. So ammonia is very difficult to treat with engineered wetlands unless you have, you know, can pro provide an additional oxygen source through cascade aeration. So using the natural fall, and then we also, because of the, the natural clay that was present, we didn't need a liner. So we were able to build ourselves right into the landscape um, using that clay as an impervious surface. We did have to excavate some topsoil, 
that was heavily loaded with nutrients because that's where they were applying all the wastewater. We took all that topsoil, we put it on an adjacent farm field, and we created wildlife habitat for extra biodiversity benefit. Now I'll go back to the, the um, looking at all of these engineered to be successful. So we reuse the primary sedimentation tank because no matter what, you really need primary treatment. We're not going to put raw wastewater into a treatment wetland. We need that solid. We can't, we can't put that heavier organic load into a wetland. Otherwise, that wetland could fail, it could clog. Um, and then we have a series of five, five cells, and a one cell that's providing additional sedimentation, but then the, the four subsequent for secondary and tertiary. We are also using all passive hydraulics, so we have stop log structures or penstock gates, rock line cascades. Our open water channels are, very, are designed kind of like a, your perforated pipes in that they're a channel in the, the beginning, a channel at the end, and a channel in the middle. That's specifically designed to distribute your flow into those shallow marshes. So one, flow distribution, distribution and collection, but second, to provide sedimentation. This is where... You know, when you go and clean out your PST, you know, get your, your biosolids, you're also going to clean out your inlet to the secondary cells because you're also going to have a lot of solids accumulation and, and phosphorus in that. Um, and then the shallow marshes, that's where you get your biodegradation. So that's where your BOD, your ammonia, that's where all that degradation occurs. So a couple pictures on some of the construction. So we started um, in spring of 2021, completed in the fall. You can see here's at, this is extra after all the topsoil has been excavated. And then this is after water has been um, provided and the, all the, the 25,000 plants have been planted. This is, sorry, this is actually a couple months later. So we, because of the planting density, we, we did nine plants per square meter. So high density on plantings, we were able to get that system up and running within the first couple months, which is, which is pretty impressive. If you're gonna go with a more open spacing, it may take a little bit longer. So we had really great coverage, great diversity of plants. And we've been able to meet um, our compliance goals for the last, three, you know, we've been monitoring it for the last three years. We've been able to meet all those, the operating techniques agreement consents, and are at we're running on an average of total phosphorus right now below three, looking at about two and a half. So we we still have a lot of um, headroom to meet that consent. One thing we did notice that we're getting excellent BOD too. We weren't. Based upon some of our design con, uh, constraints and looking at our design calculations, we had made some pretty conservative assumptions on our rate coefficients uh, for BOD, and we're seeing order of magnitude higher in the performance of the system. So that was, we were pleasantly surprised by that. So this is a system um, also in the UK for another water utility, United Utilities. This is actually a storm-driven uh, system where during non-storm events, all the flow goes, it goes through the conventional treatment, and it uses the wetlands as your tertiary treatment. But during high flows, when the, the conventional plant can't manage those flows, it bypasses the conventional plant and goes directly to the wetland. So it's a treat all flows system. Um, and then this is a system where we went in and actually rehabbed an old subsurface flow wetland. So again, due to population increases, and the, the driver from the EA that we had to reduce the number of spills, so CSO events, number of CSO events down, we had to capture and treat higher flows. We took an existing subsurface flow wetland, rehabilitated with aeration, so our intensified system, because we, you know, we were limited on our land, we had to do, work with what, we, what was available um, and just intensified it with aeration to provide that additional treatment, all those higher flows under a shorter retention time. So some of the additional systems we're working on right now, uh, we have a number of CSO wetlands from uh, all about four, four and a half, 
you know, three and a half to four and a half hectares in size. So that's 10, 10 to 12 acres in size managing CSO events. So South Emsel, Clayton West, Huffside, these are all CSO driven systems. We also have smaller systems that are less than an acre that are doing providing that enhancement of secondary phosphorus removal and tertiary treatment from aging plants that they're, they're remote locations, they're smaller populations. So we're looking at adding on, a, this would be a you know, hybridized system where the wetlands are helping, helping lift up the treatment performance and helping, helping those systems continue in operation. Um, Ilkley is also a CSO driven system. But then we're also reaching out into the catchment, into the watershed where we're looking at treating the water in, in the rivers, in the streams directly. So that's looking at within the reservoirs, um, within the streams and diverting flow um, into treatment wetlands to provide nutrient removal. This then is also helping the utilities offset their targets. So instead of having a system where you have to get down to 0.02, by engaging and going right into the war into the watershed, treating those water utilities are paying for these projects where you're treating water in the watershed. You can then get nutrient credit for that, and then you don't have to necessarily upgrade your systems. And then finally, we're looking at we have also these projects in design that are for developers. So in certain regions of the UK, similar to TM Dales here in the States, you have to demonstrate that you're not gonna have any additional increase in nutrient load um, from your development. And in that process, there's a number of different uh, mitigative measures that you can take. And with our work at Clifton and Southwaite, we've been able to demonstrate with two natural England that integrated constructed wetlands is not another mitigative option to remove nutrients. So to summarize, you know, you're looking, engineered wetlands, they've been around for a century. Um, we use them for, you may not even know it, but they, they provide a really uh, a high benefit to the communities. Um, but natural wetlands are not necessarily designed for wastewater. We need to protect those resources, and that's where engineered wetlands come into play. We can address a, number, a wide variety of contaminants, wide range of applications, diverse microbial communities, we can engineer those in a way to really benefit those communities, improve performance, it's climate adaptable, it's long life operating for, you know, systems operating for 50 years. Um, and then, but they also provide all these benefits to the public and to habitat. And I think we've undervalued those um, until recently. I think, I think now with nature-based solutions and the, the spotlight on how we can utilize these systems. I think that's where we really need to focus on how we can emphasize and optimize those systems for, for gains and co-values. And that's it, and I'll take any questions. All right, we got a handful here from the audience. Are you aware of any studies or existing engineering wetlands that can help or would be able to remove PFAS. So yes, so PFAS, I wanted to talk about that. Um, I actually uh, coordinated a, f a project to research PFAS a little over five years ago with the, uh, so in, in central New York, there's the, the SUNY ESF, Environmental Science and Forestry Campus, and a colleague there specifically focused on phytoremediation. And I had an industrial company team with me to pay for some research on studying PFAS, because I really wanted to, I'm like, there's gotta be a way we can look at this. We know PFAS can be removed through GAC, through granular activated carbon. Um, it depends on long chain, short chain, and I'm gonna geek out a little bit. Um, but so we looked at this, so I was thinking, okay, maybe there's a possibility we can adsorb PFAS onto an organic substrate. We use compost in our metal removal systems. Those, those are our, that's the, our main media is compost and wood chips. Why can we, can we test that and see if there's any opportunity for PFAS absorption? And then also look at plants. We've, there were studies that were saying that plants, we've seen PFAS concentrations within riparian vegetation along our waterways that we had PFAS exposure. 
So they went and they were doing these experiments. Initially, we thought we had some absorption. Then we realized there's some laboratory error. Um, <laughs> PFAS is very difficult to study in the lab. Um, but turns out, like, we did not get any adsorption to organics. So knock that one out. But we had really great uptake in plants. And there's additional research going on. But what we've seen so far is that plant, because PFAS is so mobile, <laughs> as the plant is transpiring and taking up water, the PFAS is just going along with it. Then the test, the, the next investigation is like, where, where does the PFAS go? What happens to it once it's in the plant? So there's a lot of research that's happening right now. Is it taking up? Is it gonna be in, in berries? Is it gonna be in leaves? Is it potential a route for ecological exposure? I think there's a lot of research that still needs to be done. I know you mentioned a little bit earlier on this question, um, but are you primarily trying to use clay liners or other styles? Yeah, so um, depending on what the contaminants are, um, you can go with like a 35 mil PVC, but if you have pretty impacted wastewater, you can go up towards a 60 mil HDP or LLD. Um, so, but with the integrated constructed wetlands, if we have clay, that's the preferred approach. You, lower cost, less excavation, um, you know, less, just less earthwork altogether, and that reduces your price of your, of your wetland. So, and then with phosphorus, it also has a benefit of potentially providing adsorption because of the iron that's associated with the clays. Now, we know that that's not going to be forever because eventually the phosphorus adsorption sites could max out. But, so we design in a conservative method where you're not, you're not assuming adsorption. We assume the long-term sustainable approach for phosphorus removal is actually through burial and accretion within the wetland. But yes, preferred approach is clay. And I know you got a lot of clay. <laughs> so. um, how constant are the plant-based treatment levels based on changes in like your temperature, seasons? Those very, yes, things. we are very seasonal focused. We use temperature coefficients in our designs um, because you'll see in the wintertime, especially in cold climates, you're not going to have any above ground biomass to provide filtration or the micro. And nitrogen is completely temperature dependent. So while we have below detection limit performance for ammonia and phosphorus in the summertime, in the wintertime, you're going to have some residual coming. So you're going to have to look at if you're operating on a 50th percentile, 95th percentile performance, you have to take that into consideration when you're doing your modeling. This, this next question is definitely regional Pacific. So what about, uh, what are the best practices available for this for wetlands for like feral hogs and other type of pest? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so having like, well, if you're dealing with hogs, don't you have, you have to have a very deep fence to keep those them from burrowing, burrowing animals to surround your your facilities, right? So that is that is critical. But other other creatures, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, we're providing we have waterfowl at our systems in the UK, um, but yeah, you could have nutria and other things too that you have to manage. I know the systems, the um, systems outside DFW, they have um, they're doing a lot of nutria. Um, they have invasive species control. They have those are like. 2,000 acre systems, they treat 90 million gallons each or so. But yeah, they had they they have an O&M operating system there where you have, you really have to pay attention to invasives, creatures and, and, and vegetation. Are the requirements for the net gain biodiversity in the UK a national or a local requirement? National. And, and it may be coming here, so depending on where you live. But I know Army Corps of Engineers is really, you know, looking at these as potential ways of no net loss of systems. So um, there's a lot there's a lot of interest in biodiversity net gain, but that's where you have opportunities. It doesn't have to be a wetland to get biodiversity net gain. That's where nature based solutions come into play. River systems adds biodiversity. Green, green, green infrastructure adds biodiversity. So this is where I feel um, up to this point, we do this because we're told we have to. We, we, we design these green infrastructure because we have to. Why aren't we getting any of the benefits of doing that? Why aren't we categorizing and tallying up all the extra benefits that we're doing just by implementing these systems? We should be getting credit for all that, those benefits. 
Thank you. That's all the questions I have on here. Does anybody else have any other questions? A um, couple of questions. If this is done on private property, is it eligible for carbon capture credits? I, I, I believe so. Okay. I'm not a carbon expert, but I believe so. If even if it's on you know private property, industrial property, you can still get credit yeah. for carbon capture. Okay. Next question: In coastal areas like we're in here, if you set up a wetland like this using more salt tolerant species of plants, could you have higher saline wastewater going in? That those plants. That's an excellent question. Yes. So doing a, like a salt marsh engineered yeah. wetland. Absolutely. Absolutely. You just have well, to take into consideration the constituents and the mobility and maybe modify your modeling a bit for that. But yes, um, absolutely. That's something I've been wanting to do for a while. I, it's not, we've been looking, we've looked at it from a produce water perspective, but not necessarily from a, a sanitary treatment perspective. What type of maintenance is required on these? I saw some of these pictures where you had pretty tall plants. So yeah. what, what is the maintenance requirement on it? Maintenance is very similar to conventional solids removal. Any of your structures are open water channels. You need to make sure that sediment is not accumulating in those systems because otherwise they're not going to be functioning as well, that organic load. And for the long term as well, phosphorus removal, you're going to have a lot of phosphorus associated with some of those sediments. So removing that from the future and allowing it to not overload the marshes is critical, but, but primarily sediment removal for all the different types of wetlands. So from the subsurface flow, the free water surface, when you get into the intensified systems, then it's like more mechanical parts. You have your air, you have your blowers, you have your valves, exercising your valves on a routine basis, similar to a conventional plant. So there's nothing really new. You know, you're looking at from a, think about it like a wastewater lagoon. You're inspecting your berms for erosion. Uh, you're wa you're monitoring your water levels. That's pretty much it. And, so, and then routine solids removal on a quarterly or annual basis, depending on what your accumulation is. Thank you very much, Amanda. I would like to add one uh, piece for this is I, um, City of Refurio is here with yes. us, the township. This is actually a grant um, we are applying with right now. We're working with a GLO. So I'm hoping by this time next year, we will that approval will go project. through and we'll be in that design state. So you can see it happen here locally. We won't be in construction by that point, but we will be in design state. So hopefully we'll be able to have some type of update and moving yes. forward so that you can see it happen here in the local area. And yeah, that system is going to be a, a essentially a, a polishing system for the existing plant. It's about three acres in size. We're fingers crossed we get that funding. Thank you, Amanda. 